giant of NBA media is leaving for a different kind of basketball job. The WNBA is adding a team, and we are exploring how scandals and heated rivalries at the highest level has changed the world of chess. It's Thursday, September 19th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Today we're talking to Front Office Sports Tuned In columnist Mike McCarthy on the implications of Adrian Wojnarowski leaving ESPN. Our breaking news reporter Margaret Fleming fills us in on the WNBA's expansion to Portland. We're talking to Chess's most popular content creator and most public-facing executive about the twists and turns the ancient game has taken recently. Plus, FSU and Clemson are in talks with the ACC on a deal that could keep them from jumping to another conference, at least for now. First, here are your top headlines. Reports are coming out that the Pac-12 is targeting Tulane and Memphis of the American Athletic Conference to round out its list of member schools that it needs in order to reach conference viability by the NCAA standards. This comes on the heels of last week's news that the conference will add Boise State, Colorado State, Fresno State, and San Diego State. That could spell trouble for the AAC, who already lost Houston, Cincinnati, and UCF to the Big 12 in the initial wave of conference realignment. Soccer legend David Beckham will be hosting a new alt cast for the Champions League called Beckham and Friends on Paramount+. Plus. Beckham and Friends will cover both the second legs of the semifinals and the finals of the 2025 Champions League. The show will feature a variety of guests from the world of sports and entertainment. Nami Patel, Disney's Senior VP of Strategy and Business Development, said that the company is working towards more bundling deals because its agreement with Warner Bros. Discovery is, quote, working really well. Disney and WBD released a $16.99 bundle for Disney+, Plus, Hulu, and Max in July, and since then, both companies have attributed subscriber growth in part to the bundle. Patel said that future deals will be assessed on a case-by-case basis, but in general, Disney's doors will be open. The Frisco City Council voted unanimously to approve a $182 million renovation to FC Dallas' Toyota Stadium. FC Dallas owner Dan Hunt said, quote, This place will be unrecognizable. It will be one of the best soccer stadiums in the country. Alongside the upcoming renovation, Hunt announced that the team signed a lease to stay in Toyota Stadium through 2057. The project is set to start in 2025 and finish in 2028. In a sudden announcement yesterday morning, renowned NBA insider Adrian Wojnarowski announced that he is retiring from ESPN to become the general manager of St. Bonaventure's men's basketball team. Wojnarowski made a name for himself over the years by breaking the biggest NBA news on Twitter time and time again. Our senior writer, Mike McCarthy, joins the show to break down what might be the last Woj bomb we ever see and why he's taking over at St. Bonaventure's. That conversation is up next. Joined now by front office sports tuned in columnist, Mike McCarthy. Welcome, Mike. Great to be here, Owen. So Adrian Wojnarowski is leaving ESPN to become the GM of St. Bonaventure. Woj is a giant of NBA media, of course. What's your initial reaction to the news? Well, it's funny that in typical Woj fashion, he saved the biggest Woj bomb of all for himself. Uh, The only thing that could have been better, Owen, is if Shams, his former protege turned rival, had broken the news. But seriously, you know, Woj is one of the most influential sports journalists of all time. Uh, You know, he's been the premier NBA newsbreaker for 15 years, and he really redefined what insiders mean in the online age. You know, it started with sort of newspaper columnists, and now it's who has the biggest Twitter following and who can get the story out first, and that goes directly back to Woj. Yeah, definitely. And I was kind of thinking, like, is he sort of a dying breed? Obviously, we've got Shams, MLB's got a a few guys, you know, like Jeff Passan, um, and, you know, Schefter on, in the NFL, you, you can name a few guys in every sport, usually guys. Um, but I, I'm wondering if it's be, becoming harder and harder to be a Woj in a world where a lot of times people just break their own news. I think that's a good insight, Owen. One of the biggest problems about becoming a Woj is the existence of a Woj. You know, how do you become the next Schefter or the next Woj or the next Passant when they dominate the field so strongly? I mean, it got to the point in NBA news where unless Woj or Shams reported it, people didn't think it was real. So I, I can imagine what it must be like for some 25-year-old up-and-comer trying to battle these guys. It, it, it's like, you know, trying to fight City Hall. So uh, there's only a couple of them. And uh, I, I think even in his his goodbye letter, you saw the human toll, though. I mean, you know, everybody would like to be Woj and have all this respect and power and move the market with a single tweet and have 7 million followers. But what kind of lifestyle is that, right? 
You know what I mean? You, you, your phone is glued to your head 24 hours a day. You wake up, you're 55 years old, you haven't seen your wife, you haven't seen your kids. You've missed every wedding, every party, every bar mitzvah, you name it. And you haven't really had a life. So I think it's a trade in there. I mean, you really have to trade in, you know what I mean, your nervous system to become one of these people. Yeah, it reminds me of this Robert Redford quote that I love. Uh, he said, if you were me for a month, you might change it to two weeks. Like, you know, <laughs> sure. It's just stressful being these guys. Um, obviously, a different situation there. But so ESPN now has a, a woge-sized hole in its NBA coverage. They are as bought in as they've ever been on the league with their new media deal kicking in. And obviously, they're all in on the NBA to begin with. What do they do here? Well, I mean, this is a, a huge issue for them, right? They just re-signed the NBA at, you know, for $2.6 billion a year. And now they lost uh, the premier uh, newsbreaker. So as you said, they've got a gigantic hole blown into their programming. Uh, I think a couple of things here. Number one, uh, from what we heard and what we reported today, ESPN is going to certainly try to talk to Shams Trania and Chris Haynes, who are both, you know, up there uh, as, you know, the second and third ranked maybe newsbreakers to Woj. Both are great, talented guys. I've followed them careers. They'd uh, they'd be terrific uh, replacements if anybody could replace Woj. And also, don't forget, they've got a huge bench of NBA insiders. You got Brian Windhorst and Marque Spears and Bon Temps and, and and guys like this. So they've got a lot of a, a ton of people who could do it. Problem is, they don't quite fit, uh, you know, the Woj mold. You know. Bobby Marks, for example, focuses on the front office, and Windhorse isn't really so much a, a Twitter newsbreaker as he is an analyst. So uh, I, I expect them to, you know, go all out to, you know, find ways to uh, to to fill this hole. And also, don't forget, Owen, they got to worry about Stephen A. Smith. Stephen A. Smith's contract is up in 2025, and there's nobody more associated with the NBA at at ESPN than Stephen A. Smith. Yeah, yeah, that's that's an interesting point. And yeah, I think they can Frankenstein a lot of what Woj brought, you know, with the guys they already have, like you said. But yeah, I mean, Shams is just the obvious replacement there. I mean, those two, you, it's hard to say one name without saying the other these days. Well, I, I think uh, timing is everything, Owen. And, you know, the timing is in ESPN's favor. Guess who's about to turn a free agent just as Woj announces retirement? Shams is going to be a free agent. He's leaving all three of his gigs, which makes him totally uh, open for 2025. So uh, I, I think, you know what I mean, if the talks haven't already started, I'd be surprised. And we already had uh, a big Shams backer, which is Pat McAfee, uh, touting him on his TV show today, saying that he's the only choice to replace uh, Woj. And as we all know, McAfee has the ear of Burke Magnus, president of Contact, Jimmy Pitaro, chairman, and even Bob Iger, the chairman of Disney. So the politicking has already be begun. And you know what I mean? I, if I was, uh, you know, to be a betting man, which I'm not, I'd bet heavily on Shams. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I just love how McAfee has, you know, no, you know, no part of him says, you know, these are these are private negotiations. Should I should I hold out? You know, who oh, just barely out the door? Like, nope. Like, you know, the same he day. He has no filter. It's great. Yeah. He, he already says, you know what I mean, this talks have started. Who knows? I mean, Pat could just be a BS. But the thing about Pat that people who know him say, you know what I mean, he's extremely loyal. So one of the reasons he loves Shams now is because four years ago, when Pat's show was new and he couldn't get a guest, Shams would go on there and be his NBA insider for free. Uh, so, you know, Pat is repaying that loyalty right now by publicly pushing for his friend. Yeah, absolutely. And even if he doesn't go to ESPN, you know, McAfee boosting him, well, that'll help negotiations with NBC, Amazon, whoever else is, is trying to throw some millions at him. Um, before we let you go, any reaction to Woj's move to become a GM of, of a college? I, you know, I think it's very interesting. We've seen a number of instances of sports TV people doing this. Uh, you know, we had Pete Bavacqua, uh, who was the head of NBC Sports, was a dream job, right? I mean, who wanted to be the head of uh, NBC Sports? He left to become the athletic director of Notre Dame, again, his alma mater. And uh, I also think there's something about this school, this uh, St. Bonaventure. Anybody who goes there is fiercely loyal to it and fiercely loyal to other people who went there. And it's amazing, you know what I mean? The number of graduates from this little tiny school 
out in the middle of nowhere in Western New York who have achieved these great positions. You know, you've got Woj, you've got Mike McCarrow at the New York Post, our own Eric Fisher at Front Office Sports is a Bonnie. So, uh, you know, you've got this little school doing a lot of big things in sports media. Yeah, very cool. Mike McCarthy, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Billie Jean King received the Congressional Gold Medal for her lifelong work in boosting women's sports and advancing pay equity in tennis and beyond. I had the privilege of interviewing her on the show over the summer, and I asked her about potentially getting this honor, and she was not especially optimistic about it happening, but she was hoping it would, because she will be the first individual female athlete to get it, and she hoped that many more would follow once someone had broken through. And yet, despite this barrier-breaking achievement, King was already ready to chat about other things later in the day. Yesterday, after acknowledging the award, she posted a video about the three changes she would make to tennis. They are, one, get rid of the bizarro scoring system instead of 15, 30, 40 game, just go one, two, three, four. Two, names and numbers on the back of every player, just make it that much easier for fans to get to know them. And finally, equal number of sets between men and women. That would also mean equal airtime on TV. Congrats, Billy, on this very much deserved honor. I'm very excited to see what you do next. A third pathway has emerged in Florida State and Clemson's battle against their own conference. As you'll recall, FSU and Clemson are suing the ACC to try to get out of the conference without having to pay an exit fee of more than $100 million. The ACC is offering them a way to make it worthwhile to stick around. Negotiations are accelerating, according to ESPN, on talks that would provide a greater share of conference revenue to the more popular schools. It would also potentially shorten the timeline for when FSU and Clemson could leave the ACC without paying a fee, because currently the conference's grant of rights runs through 2036. That's all stuff the schools want. In exchange, they would drop their lawsuits and provide some certainty for the conference going forward. However, it's not necessarily going to be an easy sell. The ACC dished out an average of $44.8 million to its schools in the 2022-23 season, which was $7 million less than the SEC. That difference is projected to top $30 million with the SEC's 10-year $3 billion deal with Disney, which kicked in this season, more than quintupling their previous deal with CBS. To get FSU and Clemson to stop trying to get to those greener pastures, the ACC is going to have to make the revenue distribution significantly more lopsided, which could be an issue with some of the other schools. That said, it would help FSU's case if they could win some football games. To a more challenging topic affecting college football, Wittenberg University, a D3 school in Springfield, Ohio, canceled all its sporting events this weekend, including its football team season opener, and moved its classes to remote only due to threats of violence. As you're likely aware, Springfield has become a flashpoint in the presidential race because of Donald Trump and J.D. Vance's repeated claims about Haitian immigrants there, which the city manager and Ohio governor Mike DeWine, among others, say have no basis in reality. That hasn't stopped people from threatening violence at Wittenberg and Clark State College, which also moved its classes online. Earlier this week, the Miami Heat became the first major team to push back on the rhetoric. The team put out a statement saying, the Miami Heat staff, like Miami itself, is a diverse and brilliant mix of vibrant cultures, including many members of our Haitian community. The false narrative surrounding them is hurtful and offensive and sadly has made innocent people targets of hurtful speech and physical threats. Our Haitian employees, fans, and friends deserve better. The WNBA announced its 15th team on Wednesday. The league is coming back to Portland, where it had a team from 2000 to 2002. Portland was the most popular guest for where the league was headed after they teased the announcement on Tuesday with a tweet saying, you know, it's better than 14 teams. Portland will join Toronto as new entrants in 2026 with San Francisco coming in next year. Commissioner Kathy Engelbert wants to get to 16 teams by 2028, and there are a lot of major markets still available. Philadelphia and Boston are two obvious options, and Houston and Denver will be in the mix as well. With only half the teams of the NBA, much of the country remains open to the growing league. My colleague Margaret Fleming has the latest on the move to Portland, and she joins us next. I'm joined now by Front Office Sports Breaking News reporter Margaret Fleming. Welcome, Margaret. Hi, Owen. Hey, great to have you on. So the WNBA is coming to Portland. What are the, what do we know so far? What are the big facts here? Coming to Portland, this is going to be the 15th team in the WNBA. Uh, The commissioner wanted to get up to 16, so almost there. Um, They'll start playing in 2026, the same year as the new Toronto team will start playing. The team is owned by the Bethal family, which is the same owners for the Sacramento Kings and the Portland Thorns of the NWSL. Um, and they'll play in the Moda Center, which is where the Blazers play. 
Um, and so this had been kind of a long process to get a WNBA team to Portland. They really, really looked like the front runner for a long time back last year. Um, and then things just sort of crumbled and fell apart. Um, there are a variety of reasons, you know, not really knowing what the future of the Moda Center was going to look like um, with the major renovations that were planned but not agreed upon yet. Um, and and uh, the investor who was involved backed out. So um, there was a lot going on there and it, and it didn't come through, but the team finally got its WNBA team. Um, it makes a lot of sense for that city. Portland obviously has made a lot of headlines about um, the sports bra, the first like women's sports bar, um, and has a really big culture of women's sports fandom. And so, um, and they had a WNBA team years ago. They had um, the Portland Fire uh, a long time ago. Um, for yeah, just, 2000 to 2002. So yeah, maybe not. There a long is a time history ago. there, but it's yeah, it's it's uh, it's not a not a recent history. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, and it sounds like you know they wanted Portland, um, and now they've got you know someone who is willing to fund it and stick around. I think yes, there are renovations to the Moda Center, and we should touch on those, but. Um, the the WNBA knew about that before they were very close to announcing Portland last year, and um, but I think it was yeah their their backer pulled out. Uh, but yeah, the Moda Center is undergoing renovations over the next five years, and now there's I, I guess there might be some announcement around how that's all going to be scheduled. Yeah, I'm definitely looking out for that announcement um, because the Moda Center the way I mean the way that just like these seasons align is that the NBA plays in the winter and then the WNBA plays in the summer when they're off and on both ends depending on how far each team makes it in the playoffs there could be some overlap and so I'm very curious when this is all going to happen like I said they're not going to start until 2026 so um, I guess until the beginning of the 2025 season you know that summer will be open the beginning of the 2025 NBA season um, that 2025 summer will be open but um, these are these are big renovations this is supposed to be the first like set of major renovations to this 30 year old arena um, that it's it's never had like a major you know upgrade like this um, and that's the plan is supposed to take five years it costs a lot of money and so um, you know they got public funding for it so yeah I'm curious what this is going to look like and what kind of the timeline is going to look like I would imagine most of the big stuff will happen at the beginning before they're kind of juggling back and forth. But um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how this would impact either team's schedule or um, if the teams end up having to move to another facility for a year or two. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a big question mark, I think, right now. At the same time, the the owners are planning on building a practice facility brand new for the team. So that's another construction project <laughs> they have going on. So um, yeah, there's a couple question marks around the logistics of this, but um, the motor center renovations are definitely a lot further along than they were last or the conversations are a lot further along than they were last year. So even though there are still question marks, there's a lot more certainty to the plan than there was, you know, when this all blew up a year ago. Right. And especially because the WNBA sort of cited the renovations as the reason they didn't go to the Moda Center, um, or sorry, didn't go, go to Portland um, last year or didn't announce it last year. Clearly, they've got something figured out here, one would imagine. Uh, we should also touch on the um, the fee that the, their, the Bothell family is paying to start a team in Portland. Uh, it's a large one. Yeah, according to the AP, they're paying $125 million for this uh, team. Um, that's more than the $115 million that uh, the Toronto owners paid just four months ago. So um, showing that kind of upward trajectory um, for W franchises, again, so much, you know, so much less than um, an NBA franchise would cost or, or you know, an equivalent sports team. But um at the same time, the W is kind of at this precipice where it's like, it's at this point where like it has all the attention and all the excitement and all the fans um, for that kind of bigger media deal, especially that they're getting, but like for that expansion, for all that growth. Um, but financially, they're still kind of in that place where they don't have that money yet. Um, and so I think it kind of makes sense. It's kind of on pace um, with where the growth is. We're not going to see, you know, uh, much larger than that, I wouldn't think, for the next expansion team either. Um, but I think team valuations will go up a lot more in the next, you know, two years even when there's more money in the league. It's just for now, it's still kind of um, kind of small. Margaret Fleming, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Owen.
Two years ago, chess endured a major cheating scandal, which started when the world's best player, Magnus Carlsen, accused Grandmaster Hans Niemann of cheating at a match in St. Louis. A few weeks ago, they played again at the Speed Chess Championship semifinals. Magnus beat him soundly, but Hans took the opportunity to accuse Magnus and other popular figures in the chess world of conspiring to ruin him. Two of those figures, Danny Wrench and Levy Rosman, are my next guests. We spoke about Hans and his impact on the chess world and the overall growth of the game. That conversation is next. I'm joined now by Chess.com Chief Chess Officer Danny Wrench and Levy Rosman, host of the most popular chess channel on YouTube, Gotham Chess. Welcome, Danny. Welcome, Levy. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So, Danny, let's start with you. I just want to start by zooming out on the popularity and growth of chess. If we go back to the pandemic when we were all stuck inside and there was a very popular Netflix show, The Queen's Gambit, that I think caused a huge surge in people being interested in the game, wanting to learn, wanting to get better. Um, then we had a certain chess cheating scandal two years ago that thrust chess back into the headlines. And uh, and so, yeah, and now, you know, now it's 2024 and we just had the Speed Chess Championship. We've got the World Championship coming up. Just give us kind of a state of the game and how things have progressed over the last few years. I appreciate that. I think you, I think you kind of hit the, the high level bullet points of, of some of the things that happened. But if I was to say, maybe one of the main things that really helped not just contribute to the growth of, of the online chess community, but also I think help frame chess properly as, as we've always felt, speaking for Levy and I, that chess is maybe a lot more fun, more accessible and cooler than people ever, ever thought was actually the work of people like Levy, Gotham Chess. We think of Hikaru Nakamura, we think of the Botez sisters. And the reason I highlight that is because while everything you said was true, there was an unfortunate global pandemic, there was the Queen's Gambit Netflix show, and then later on there was the unfortunate cheating scandal that led to a lot of discussion and a lot of interest. The truth is the people kind of helping to drive and to serve the community of new chess enthusiasts were the creators online. And I think what a lot of people don't know is that we had been working hard together and planting the seeds, if you will, uh, for the potential harvesting moment that maybe we didn't know was coming via those things like a pandemic and like the Netflix show and, and the cheating scandal. But we had been working hard to be there to make chess more accessible and to make it a little bit easier to get involved than people would have thought. And so while we benefited from some of these waves, I think that the creators and the people uh, connecting with fans every step of the way, whether they find them on YouTube or on Twitch or on short form content verticals, as we call them now, like TikTok and Instagram and Snapchat, I think that we've been working hard as as an organization, as a, as a business to just make chess more fun and more accessible. And I think as some of the big waves came, we were maybe more ready to capitalize on that and to keep those audiences around than people thought. And so that's my that's my quick addition to what you outlined as as what was really true. But but really, I would say that the credit goes to the creators. And can you just give us if you have any numbers on just like growth over the last year or two? Um, is there a percentage or a total number you can throw at us? Uh, yeah, I can say it took us 10 years to get to a million daily active users and 100,000 subscribers. And within a year or so, we were at uh, 10 million daily active users and about a million. That's a number we've, we've, we've been able to say publicly now. And, and from, a, from a subscriber standpoint and from a monthly active user standpoint, we maintain well over 50 monthly active users, sorry, 50 million, which is a big number when you think that 50 million people at some point in a month are engaging with chess.com and the online chess community. Um, and those are just chess.com's numbers, 50 million monthly, 10 million daily, about a million paying subscribers. That doesn't even include, I think, all the people who are touching down with chess content on the other larger platforms than, than our own, right? Like YouTube, like Twitch, like other types of social media platforms. So uh, those are some quick quick hit numbers. And yeah, speaking of all the chess content, Le Levy, let's go to you. How have you felt the growth of chess over these last few years as a content creator? Um, yeah, I'm not even sure where to begin. Uh, what I usually do uh, to give kind of my, my version of things is um, I was in college from 2013 to 2017. In 2014, I started teaching chess. So my, my job from 2014 at the tender age of 19 uh, w was to be a chess teacher to kids in New York City. Uh, ultimately, that led to me running 
my own program. What that means is you have a couple of kids, you know, in the after school classes, you do private lessons, you take the kids to tournaments. The program that I ran was pretty successful. I always kind of wanted to run my own thing. I started running my own program at, at 19, 20. Uh, and I did this until March, 2020. So I even remember when I left a, a private lesson and I saw the first reported case of COVID in New York. And I thought, okay, this will be two weeks. Great. I get a little vacation. Uh, then it's like a lightning bolt hit the, the, the universe, which it, it, it definitely did for a lot of us in, in a lot of different ways. Um, and then there's three inflection points. So October 2020, when the Queen's Gambit comes out, uh, September 4, 2022, when Magnus and Hans play in St. Louis, and then around January 2023, which is the explosion of short form content in chess, which a lot of people don't know because it's not as interesting to publicize as like a Netflix series. That boom in 2023 was maybe five times larger view wise and conversion wise uh, than the Queen's Gambit. The Queen's Gambit took my 48 hour window of viewership from 100,000. I would get 100,000 views collectively on all my videos in 48 hours. The Queen's Gambit took that to a million. And wow. then short form content, you know, what I always say is it took me 18 months to go from one to two million subscribers. And it took me 40 days to go from two to three million. And that 40 days was January, 2023. So short form content was an even bigger push. And, you know, now I've probably got, I don't know, 10 million followers across multiple platforms and over 3 billion total views on chess content. And that absolutely blows my mind. Um, and yeah, I mean, from, I, I still, you know, I could wake up and it still feels like January, 2020, and I'm still being a chess teacher here locally. Yeah. And on that, that short form boom, is this just you doing more short form videos or is this like a, like YouTube doing something or like, what are we talking about here? Yeah. I mean, actually I had a conversation with, uh, with Danny in maybe November, December, 2022. And he said, you know, I really think the short form thing is potentially really going to be good for chess. Uh, Danny is like the guy from Harry Potter with the, with the prophecy in his hand sometimes. And he's really sharp. And I, and I, I was like, all right, you know, maybe you got a point. I'm going to give it a shot. Let's see what happens. Because how the he how can you teach people chess in 30 seconds? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Um, but I made a few videos. I would voice over funny moments at tournaments or something that like, you know, Magnus or Hikaru, the, you know, the most famous players and the best players in the world would do. Or I would teach someone how to play a gambit in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And there was a period of time there where it would get a million views in four hours. Wow. And... Um. It was just hitting people's algorithms at the right time when I think a lot of people were in a lull on short form content and kind of bored of it. And suddenly you could learn a crazy trick on, you know, on, on TikTok, on YouTube shorts, on Instagram reels. So I think we, we, we hit a gold mine at the right moment. I wouldn't say I carried short form content, but like, I mean, in terms of numbers, like I, I can say in the month of January, that, that month, I think collectively on everything, I had 300 million views and that was fueled by shorts and that wow. converted to you know that converted to long form viewership in some capacity maybe there's kind of this broader topic of like characters in chess right like there's um you know in the 90s we had like karpov and kasparov and that's probably all anyone knew um now you know maybe there's like this broader world of like yeah magnus and hikaru but now we've got this kind of wild card of hans neiman who is you know i, th I think a top 20 player in the world or somewhere close to that you know, whether it's whether it's the politically correct thing to say or not, the controversy surrounding the discussion about not just what happened in St. Louis, but Hans Neiman as a character in terms of the things he says. No one in the chess world has ever called their shot before where someone goes on social media is like, I'm going to do this. And then he does it. Right. Uh, and then talks trash against the goat, which he may or may not be regretting now. Right. Based on some of the some of the ways things went down in Paris and um and his post uh, kind of exit interview. But either way, it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's fascinating to watch, right? And I think that um, Hans obviously has had a perspective and um, an and agenda, if you will, that has come with that. At the same time, given, given how things went in Paris and given what he said toward the end, I think maybe, you know, just by getting the opportunities that he's now getting and has gotten, he kind of has no choice but to put down a little bit of his chess mafia claim sword because no matter what he says, kind of the actions speak louder. He's continued to be given a platform 
And then he's kind of recognizing like, ah, maybe I'm not quite at this level yet. I mean, to be fair, everyone inside the chess community wasn't even allowed to just say Hans is not at Magnus or Hikaru's level because we sounded biased. Or, of course, Danny Wrench is the evil chess mafia. Of course he would say that, right? But we all knew the truth. And then, frankly, the chess spoke for itself in Paris. And so it was a little bit of like a wake-up call from the outside world and media point of view because not everyone else knew that. They didn't know that, that that was really the case. And so and I'm not even saying that to disrespect or disparage Hans. I've said many times, he's 21 years old. He's in the top 20 in the world, a super talented kid who brings a huge personality to the game that I think is is awesome and, and, and has inspired his own fan base. That said, it also almost adds to the story that he got his ass kicked a little bit, right? And now what's he going to do, right? How's he going to handle that? I think the way he conducted himself humbly on social media afterwards was actually amazing and frankly is the right call because it will endear fans to him who are looking to support and rally behind someone who might be a little different than the traditional chess characters with the with the proverbial you know bleep he's he's willing to talk. So I'll say this like we're just kind of here for seeing what happens, right? Despite all of the claims, there is no agenda or conspiracy or anything but chess.com being interested in growing the game, serving the community and being a healthy stable actor, frankly, in the space. Despite what people claim, we've continued to do that and, and we have always been that. So I'm kind of here for it to see what happens next. As long as everyone is 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 acting in, 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 in good accordance, then uh then we're here for for the opportunity that is let the chess players fight it out on the board. And I kind of hope that they continue to go at it a little bit because it's interesting. Um I'm not really into the you know the sensationalism of it. At the same time, it's not really my call. And our job is to do a really great job providing events, making sure they are fair and clean, and then letting the chess players go at it. And that's what we're going to do while Hans continues to do what Hans is going to do. And the rest of the chess world is going to react to it uh, however however they want. I also have yeah, some thoughts, me, but... Uh, yeah, I, I, let me go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, because obviously I'm approaching it from the create. You know, I I, I didn't have right. to make any decisions about Hans uh, and his accounts. I didn't have to publish any reports. I didn't. You know, I, I I had the exclusive benefit of almost being a spectator of his whole rise, uh, and then obviously the the whole scandal. So, but there, but there was a lot to unpack there. So I'm going to try to do my best. Number one, you know, this this notion that you a media personality, even if if controversial like Hans, is is ultimately a benefit just to draw attention to a game. There's some people who would go all the way back to square one, no pun intended there, and go, why do we even need more people to play chess? I mean, there's people who have argued like the last four years, like what was so special? Why did we need all these people to get into our game? And that, that, th those people can argue that point out. So once you cross that, that threshold of like, why, it's great. I mean, more people are playing. You know, uh, I always point to a statistic, for example, chess used to be 99% male, 1% female on the chess uh, audience and analytics on, on YouTube. Mine is now around 85.15 and my video, how to play chess period is 67.33. It's two to one. It used to be 99 to one. So people from all over the world and particularly young women and uh, you, know, you, you, you have teenagers, you have adults getting into the game as well. It's, it's a special thing and just more people are playing, more people are connecting over generations of their family uh, and things like that. Now, when you talk about uh, media and and social media and getting attention to the game, yeah, chess players historically have just not done that. The top level chess is not tennis. It's not these big opens where it's a knockout system. There's no guarantee of, of participation. Chess is a bubble. You try to make it into the top 20. You get invitations to private events. Your prize money is guaranteed. Stay in that top 20. Be good. Don't say anything crazy. That's going to be your career. Maybe you'll become world champion. Probably not because usually it's dominated by one person for 20 years. Um, but now chess is opening up a little bit. And I wish the younger generation would be better on social media in a controversial way or not. And Hans in particular, before the scandal, was already kind of like a trash-talking kind of brash guy. And in fact, in many ways, he reminded me of me when I was younger. I used to get kicked out of chess camps. I was yeah. never as good as Hans, but I kind of looked at him like, this is, you know, this guy's like pretty fun for the game. And if he succeeds, it's going to be awesome. But really, you know, for anybody who listens to this, the really brief summary that I can give about the whole Hans Demon thing is this is a young man who cheated in chess online as a teenager and would not, and said in interviews, he would absolutely never do it over the board. And the fact that he did not do it in live physical elite high level competition, 
but that still will kind of follow you around. And that's what chess is currently battling. And it caused the scandal because it ultimately caused Magnus to decide to withdraw after losing to him in a game because he couldn't trust him. And he, he was making it sort of public that he doesn't. And that's where the scandal happened. And so now Hans not only has the previous personality before the scandal, he also has the fact that the entire world put this target on him. Elon Musk retweeted a theory of, of how he could cheat. It was, I mean, it was not, you know, it was not appropriate. And mm -hmm. now he's got all of that as well. And he's got the people that are cheering for him to succeed. And he's got the people who are cheering for him to fail and will never believe him. But yeah, he's a, he's a top three most famous chess player in the world. And yeah. that'll never change. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's so polarizing right now. And I feel like he can't do an interview without... 2022 coming up and like the question of whether he cheated in that one game and i think it's just this permanent you know he said he said situation um because all the evidence no new evidence is going to come out unless someone says like i was hans accomplice and here's how we did it that's not going to happen either so yeah i mean it, the, the whole thing i find completely fascinating i would say if you look back historically on chess it's been um wildly different forms of controversy in 1978 world championship you know they thought a player was getting information about the position because of blueberry yogurt being del delivered mid-game well. uh yeah the 1978 world championship is worth an entire probably you know, limited series of its own but there's always been controversy in chess there's been organizations battling uh people battling uh countries and federations and 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 so on and so forth so it's always been closely tied to it. And I think it's because the chess is such an individualistic activity and requires such an unbelievable amount of ego, not even in a bad way. Any elite athlete, especially yeah. in a solo sport, tennis players are memed on for yelling at their trainers the entire match. I mean, that's like borderline abusive, <laughs> like, but, <laughs> but it's just like part of the sport. But when they give their interviews, they're very professional. Like very few of them actually are too brash or talk trash. Maybe they, you know, go at a journalist. That's like at, at most what, what, what happens. Uh, but then you have WWE, you have UFC, where mm -hmm. especially since the rise of a guy like Conor McGregor, going at somebody is just par for the course. You put it on for the cameras. You might be great behind the scenes, but the behind the scenes, is, it's, at the end of the day, it's a business. And people have to watch and people have to care. Uh, does chess need controversy to thrive? I would say no. What chess needs is a young generation willing to give back both in digital content and live on the ground and do things with beginners, do things with important, let's say, business folks, entrepreneurs, athletes, local to where they're, they're playing. It's one of the most international games in the world. Will chess be benefited tremendously by international scandals? Yes. <laughs> and... Um, you know, then people will watch and be fascinated. Uh, I might watch a sports scandal, but I'm not going to try the sport because I'm not athletic. But the barrier to entry to chess is actually extremely low. People just don't like to try it because it makes them feel dumb. But once you get past that hurdle, um, it's it's actually very fun and relatively easy to learn. Uh, so the, the chess is like other elite sports. It's more and more a young person's game. We might have an 18-year-old world champion um if if gukesh wins the the championship um and you know obviously we have some magnus is what he's 33 or something we have top players who are in their 30s um uh, but more and more you know the, the the top levels of the game are you know 18 to, to to around 30. um what does that mean in terms of how the game is gonna grow and progress i guess i'll i'll jump in on that quickly um because you reminded me of a conversation I was having last night uh, with someone outside the chess community who was asking kind of similarly, what is the next generation of chess players capable of, especially in this world where they have, imagine, imagine if you were a seven-year-old growing up and your backyard was a shared tennis court with Roger Federer. What would what would you be capable of if you had access to that level of competition at that age and at scale where you were just playing him one time? We're actually seeing this happen in chess because of the online chess servers, because of chess.com connecting Magnus Carlsen with young rising talents from Argentina to Turkey to everywhere else pretty much every Tuesday. And what has become this 
this huge event for the chess community called Title Tuesday, we're we're not even really sure how good someone can get how quickly. Honestly, I think that frankly, anyone who claims that we're not going to continue to see records broken and continue to see the world become more, I mean, the chess world become more global because it has been shrunk online via technology is just crazy. And in fact, we sit in a spot where we're always like, wow, I mean, what is going to happen with this next generation of chess players? Uh, I hope that they are also outspoken and active and help create brands for themselves, whether of the controversial nature or not. As Levy said, I think everyone should just be themselves because I think that would be good. And I think fans want to see that. They want to see you open up, especially in a game that has historically been very reserved, right? And had stigmas of being antisocial and all those things. So I hope that those things happen. But even if not every young player in the next generation is going to build a media empire for themselves, we are going to see more fascinating storylines with people coming from out of nowhere, so to speak, because of access to the best chess players in the world online and the trajectories of those players' careers and, and, and the growth curves are going to continue to be hard to understand and to navigate. And just to wrap a ribbon on my thoughts on that, it was a big part of how we always approach this whole thing and how we've given young players the benefit of the doubt many times, even those who have made the mistake of breaking the rules and cheating, because we do want to be the platform that creates an opportunity for chess to transcend and to change the way people think about it more than just as a media chess is fun and look at these wild short form vertical highlight videos, but also on the board, creating opportunities for young players, protecting the game along the way. We, we feel super excited about this. So to answer your question, like, I don't know what's going to happen, but we're super excited about what the future holds because I think it's, it's more, more unpredictable. Um, and in some ways, I think the upside of the game on a global level and, and, and for these stars to get recognized and maybe hopefully get support and sponsors, all those things, it's better than it's ever been. The future of the game, I think, is brighter uh, than, than it's ever been in its history. Danny, Re Danny Wrench, Levy Rosman, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Time now for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports. Developers from Autoport US presented a plan for a $100 million luxury racing track in North Carolina. The racing track, called the Uari Motorsports Park and Resort, is set to be built in Moore County, about 20 miles outside of Pinehurst, host of this year's US Open. The plan details a 400-acre plot with a three-mile road course designed by global track designers Driven International and 165 private car condos. The plans for the racetrack were announced in May, and Autoport US is hoping to break ground in December of this year, but they are still seeking approval from local commissioners. If approved, the Motorsports Park is set to open at the start of 2027. The park is being built in a remote part of the state with the closest town seven miles away and a population of only 1,200 people. That's it for today. Drop us a rating or review and chime in on anything from this show at today at frontofficesports.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.